Happy Easter, or Resurrection Sunday as I prefer to call it. I hope that you are healthy and safe and well. More than anything, I hope that in this time of difficulty, in this time of discomfort, that you are finding hope and encouragement from the presence of God and your relationship to Him. Uh, and I hope that these sermons that I've been putting on YouTube, our Bible studies, the little devotionals, I hope that they've also been encouraging you and helping you to keep your eyes on Jesus in this difficult season. Uh, I'm praying for you. And uh, before we go any further, let's just open with a word of prayer as we explore reflections from the resurrection and how it impacts our life today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. King Jesus, Lord, we celebrate today that you are a living Savior, and because you are a living Savior, we have a living hope. Lord, we celebrate today that when the world is panicked and in chaos, we don't have to be because we can trust that we are in your hands according to your purpose and plans, and you're working all things out for the good of those of us who love you and are called to your purpose. Lord, we bless you today. We thank you that the tomb is empty. Lord, we thank you for all of the implications and applications that brings to our lives. Lord, we know Easter tells us very clearly, Lord, that just because something looks bad or just because something is bad, just because something is difficult for a season, doesn't mean that's the end of the story. So we bless you today. We exalt you. Lord, I pray that you would take these words and more importantly your word and you would bless those that are watching this sermon today you would give us hope you give us encouragement and lord that we would rejoice today because we have a living savior lord we exalt you and we bless you we pray that you would draw all people to you and we ask this in the mighty name of jesus amen now over the last couple of weeks we've been exploring the book of first peter and the reason for that is first peter gives us a lot of great encouragement in times of suffering so we're going to begin today uh, in the next section of first peter just because it it happens to tie into the easter message as well um, but we're going to really move to corinthians i just wanted to share these verses in first peter i'm not really going to expound on them just to kind of connect what we have been talking about to the Easter message. So if you have your Bibles, look at the first chapter of 1 Peter. We're going to go down to verse 10, uh, down to verse 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. Now I only mention this passage of scripture really for a couple of reasons. We're going to see here in a moment when we go to 1 Corinthians 15 that Paul again and again is going to say that Jesus' death Jesus' burial, Jesus' resurrection happened according to the scriptures, Paul says. And Peter here says the same thing. Uh, and it just so happens that this text ties perfectly into what we're talking about today. But, but Peter says, look, the prophets in the Old Testament, they prophesied about this. They weren't really sure who this was going to be, who the Christ was going to be. They weren't really sure of when these things were going to happen. They just knew that the Holy Spirit was giving them a revelation that this person was coming, and also that the Holy Spirit revealed to them that this blessing was for people in the future. And so they prophesied that the Christ was going to come, and specifically I want to point out this uh, this verse to you in verse 11, uh, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. That's really what we're going to talk about today is the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. And one last thing just to mention in this passage before we go to the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, just something that I think that I've always found fascinating is the very last part of verse 12 says that these things, the things about the gospel, are things into which angels long to look. Now, we, we are fascinated by angelic beings, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that, a lot of good reasons. But, you know, this verse actually tells us that angels look into the gospel, and they're trying to figure out why would God love us? Why would God send his son? Why would this happen? Angels long to look into the redemption that we have. 
they don't understand the immense love that God has for us. And I think that that's a good thing. We don't, we shouldn't understand the love that God has for us too, because we don't deserve it. And it's just a matter of grace on His part. So, with that kind of as an introduction, I want to move to the book of First Corinthians, chapter fifteen, what is often referred to as the resurrection chapter. And First Corinthians, chapter fifteen, verse three says this. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. And the first thing I want to just point out here is Paul says, I, I gave this to you of first importance, meaning that the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, what he's going to talk about here in these verses, they were the first things that Paul shared with the Corinthian church. Why? Because they were of first importance. Look, it doesn't, I say this all the time, it doesn't matter if you've understood every, you know, mystery in the scripture. If you don't understand the gospel, all of that doesn't mean a whole lot to you. You may have memorized scripture. You may go to Sunday school. You may have a lot of things really solid, but if you don't understand the gospel, and if you haven't understood how Jesus's death and burial and resurrection impact you and relate to you personally, all the rest of it doesn't matter. The most important thing, the most foundational thing, the first thing that we've got to talk about, the first thing that we've got to understand is the gospel, that Jesus died and that he rose again. That's the most important thing. But notice this again, I mentioned this a moment ago. He says this happened according to the scriptures. And what we see is that there are countless passages in the Old Testament that prophesied Jesus's birth his life, factors in his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his second coming is also prophesied in both the Old and the New Testament. Everything in Jesus' life happened to fulfill Scripture. But here's the part I don't want you to miss. Look again at chapter 15, verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Now listen, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with with the scriptures. Did you catch that? It's something that we can easily overlook, especially if you're like me, you grew up in church. The Bible says right here very clearly, why did Jesus die? He died for our sins. And so the first thing we got to establish today for Easter to have the meaning that should for you today, do you understand that the death of Jesus on the cross was for your sins? And I want to just explore that for a moment. Um, John 3.16 is probably the most famous verse in all of the Bible. Uh, most of you have it memorized. If, even if you're not really a, a Christian, you've probably heard it. Uh, John 3.16 kind of gives us the same picture. I want to just look at it again with you and, and maybe see it with a fresh eye today. John 3.16, Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so I just want to ask you today, do you know that God loves you? Not just in a general sense, like he loves everybody, that's true, but that God has a special love directed towards you. And, and you could translate John 3.16 that God loved the world in this way, or God displayed his love for the world in this way, that he gave his only begotten son, that's Jesus, and whoever believes in him won't perish but have everlasting life. And so there's this immense love from God for you, and I want you to know that, but also you need to understand this, that Jesus died for your sins. When the Bible says that God gave his only begotten son, what does it mean? It means he gave him and let him die. He sent him knowing that he would die. And Corinthians tells us in chapter 15, verse 3, that he died for our sins. So if you can just pause here for a moment and, and understand that, make this very personal in two ways. One, so we say, for God so loved you, not just the world, but for God so loved you that he gave his only son for you to die for your sins. And you say, well, I, you know, I feel like I'm a pretty good person, and I'm sure by my standard you are. But here's the thing. It's by God's standard that we must measure ourselves. And to be where God wants us to be, to be in a relationship with him, and to get into heaven, we have to be perfect. Now listen, we understand this in a sense because even though we're sinful people, we get angry towards certain sin. We get angry towards murder. We get angry towards 
theft. You know, no one, none of us would say child abuse is a good thing. We get angry about that. Even though we're sinful, we have anger towards sin. Here's the difference between us and God. God is perfect in his holiness. So if I, as a sinful person, can get angry at certain sinful behaviors, then certainly God, who's perfect in his holiness, can and does get angry at any sin, at all sin. And so there's this wrath that God has for us, but he loves us. And so what does he do? He sends Jesus. He gives Jesus. And Jesus dies for our sins. And my favorite verse of Scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the final verse of the chapter. I want to just read it to you just so you can see it again. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And what's going on in this passage of Scripture is Paul is saying, look, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. You've been made new. The old person has died, and now you're a new person in Christ, and you've been reconciled to God. But how did that happen? Verse 21 tells us that he, that's God the Father, made him, that's Jesus the Son, God made Jesus the Son who knew no sin. He had never sinned. He had always been in perfect fellowship with the Father. He made him to be sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. So there's an exchange at the cross. Jesus dies for our sin. He takes the wrath of God for our sin so that we don't have to. And anyone who comes to Jesus in faith, anyone who believes in him as their Lord and their Savior, they, they not only have Jesus take their sins and the penalty for their sins, but Jesus actually gives them what Paul calls the righteousness of God. There's an exchange that happened on the cross if you've believed in Jesus. And that's the most important thing today. Have you believed in Jesus personally? Not has your parents, not, not have, do you go to church, not are you a member of a church, not do you own a Bible. All those things are good and fine and blessings. But the question, the ultimate question, really the only question that matters on this Easter Sunday is, have you been born again by placing your personal faith in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Is he the king of your life? Has he redeemed you? Do you understand that he died for your sins today? You see, Jesus died an excruciating death on the cross. In fact, the word excruciate comes from the word crucifixion in Latin. Jesus died a humiliating, lonely, despairing death on the cross. But you know what? All that physical stuff, as terrible as it was, that was not the worst part of the crucifixion. The worst part of the cross was that in spite, on top of all that physical stuff, Jesus was bearing the full, unbridled wrath of God the Father. And he did that because we have sinned. And so because he loves us, he wants to have a relationship with us. But because of our sin, and he's perfectly holy, there's a, there's a divide here. And so Jesus says, I'll stand in the middle between God the Father and you people. I'll bear the wrath of the Father so that you can have the love of the Father if you believe in me, if you trust in me, if you rely on my death and my resurrection to be the only way that can save you. Have you done that today? Jesus has died for your sins today. Now let's move on because it's Easter, and let's talk about the next part of this. The exciting part about this is not only did Jesus die for our sins, but Jesus was buried and he came back to life again. That's why what we celebrate on Resurrection Sunday. So go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, read verses 3 uh, down to 6. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and then he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Now, we'll start with the end here because this is an important fact, but it's not the most important fact. Jesus' death was public. It was a public execution. It was, it was seen by many, many people. But Jesus says, I'm going to come back. He, he told that it was going to happen before he died. So Paul here says a very important thing. 
that Jesus' resurrection was witnessed by the apostles. He mentions Cephas, that's Peter. He mentions the other apostles. But then he says there were even more than 500 people that saw Jesus after his resurrection. And here's the important thing that Paul says to them, look, most of these people are still living. Go talk to them. Don't just take my word for it. These people saw the resurrected Christ, and their life is forever changed by that. We're going to see here in a moment that the resurrection is extremely important for everything in the Christian life, both here on earth and in heaven. It all hinges on the resurrection. But that's why for all atheists and all of the time you see people trying to discredit the validity of the resurrection. Every couple of years you see some documentary where they found the bones of Jesus, you know, and Jesus didn't resurrect. Why do they do that? Because atheists know that our faith hinges on the resurrected Christ. If Jesus didn't come back to life, Paul is going to say, our faith is in vain. And so Paul says, look, there's more than 500 people. Go talk to them. But here's a, the other thing I want to point out to you. He was buried and he was raised according to the scripture. Now the Bible tells us that two members of the council, two of the religious leaders, a man named Nicodemus, who John 3.16 is actually spoken to, Jesus says John 3.16 to Nicodemus, he's a Pharisee, and another Pharisee named Joseph of Arimathea, they both opposed crucifying Jesus. They both uh, were not in favor of this, and they went to Pontius Pilate and asked for his body so that they could give him a proper burial. It was prophesied that the Messiah would be buried in a borrowed tomb, and that's exactly how of all the uh, ceremonies, he was buried. They went through all the motions and the ceremonies that normally come in a Jewish uh, rite of passage for death. And he's anointed and he's buried and all this stuff. But then three days later, he comes back. Now, can you just take a moment here and imagine how the poor disciples felt between the death of Jesus and and the resurrection of Jesus. These people have left their homes, they've left their jobs, many of them have left their families temporarily to follow Jesus and over the course of three years they now are convinced that Jesus is the Messiah that they've waited for their whole lives. And then in Gethsemane he's arrested, he's beaten, he's spat upon and eventually he's executed on a cross which was the most humiliating way, the worst way to be killed. It meant that you were a public enemy, a public uh, menace to the Roman Empire and it was painful so that nobody else would do that and now he's dead and, and if you're Peter and the rest of these guys you're thinking man what in the world? If you've ever stepped out in faith and things didn't go the way you thought they should you can understand how these people felt at least in part. They're like, man, what, we, we, we thought for sure this was what God wanted. We thought for sure this was the Messiah. How could it end so badly? But how much can change in a couple of days? And that's what I want to tell you today. We're going through this mess right now. How much can change in a couple of days in the power of God? You say, Good Friday, it looked like failure. It looked like tragedy. And Easter Sunday completely flips the situation. Now here's what I want to challenge you with. How can you understand the resurrection. I mean, like, what does it do for you today? How does it help you today? I mean, like, because I, as a Christian, as someone who grew up in church, like, it's easy for me to come like, yeah, 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 I know that. Like, I've seen the felt board. I've seen the stories. I've done the coloring pages. I've been in Sunday school. I've heard all the sermons. And, and, and honestly, preaching Easter sermons is the hardest thing for me because everybody knows the story. And how do we, how do we connect to it and, and understand that this is not just something that happened, but it's something that is meant to give life today. It's meant to have application today, just like everything in the scriptures. I want to give you a couple things here from 1 Corinthians that I believe are in incredibly significant applications to our life today. Number one, the resurrection is what brings victory in the Christian life, and victory in a number of areas. Number one, it brings victory over sin. Go down to chapter 15, verse 14. We're going to skip over a lot of this. I'm just going to kind of pick out the highlights. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. Paul says, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. And go down to verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. So here's what's going on. In the Jewish world, in the Jewish theology, there was a divide. The Pharisees, who we know very well from Jesus' ministry, they believed in what we would call the mystical, supernatural things. They believed in angels and demons. They believed in miracles. They believed in a resurrection from the dead. The other religious group, the Sadducees, 
uh, who were wealthy and political, they, they did not believe in those things. They did not believe in the resurrection. So some of that theology has crept into the early church. And there's, there's this debate about, you know, do people really come back from the dead? Is there really going to be a resurrection? And Paul writes this chapter to say, look, if nobody's coming back, if there is no resurrection, then Jesus didn't come back. Easter sun Sunday was not real. And here's the problem with that. If that didn't happen, then everything in the Christian life that's built on that falls down too. And so catch what he says here in verse 17. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Remember, Paul just said a minute ago, he died, Jesus died for our sins. But now he's saying, look, if Jesus is still dead, it's, our faith is useless. We're still in our sins because, listen, a dead Savior can't help you. A dead Savior can't save you. And so Paul, of course, here is saying Jesus did come back from the dead. The resurrection is real. So obviously you are, your faith does have meaning. Your faith does bring victory. Your sins have been dealt with because when Jesus was brought back from the dead, what that shows us is that God was perfectly satisfied with his sacrifice. Remember what Jesus says as he dies. In, in Greek, he says, to telestai. And to telestai means it is finished. It's an accounting term where it means, look, the debt is paid in full. So Jesus tells us this is the end. This is where your sins stop being a problem with your relationship with God, those who believed in Jesus. But when God brings him back, it's a signifying thing that says, look, God is pleased in the sacrifice of Jesus. And because Jesus has resurrected, our faith is not futile and our sins have been dealt with. So we have victory over sin. Not only that, the resurrection of Jesus shows us that we have victory over death. And that makes sense because the result of sin is death. The wages of sin is death, Paul says in Romans. So when he deals with sin, he also deals with death. Go down to 1 Corinthians 15 verses 18 and 19. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Now you have to understand that what Paul is doing here is saying, look, if the resurrection didn't happen, then you've got these problems. Number one, you're still in your sins. Your faith is a waste of time. It's futile. It means nothing. But then he says this, if Christ has not come back from the dead, then those who have fallen asleep, those who have perished that are Christians, they're just dead. They're just dust. They're not anything. They're just bones. But then Paul says, look, if we only have hope in Christ in this life, we deserve to be pitied. And I believe that's one of the most clearly true statements in the Scripture. If this is all we get, if this is all there is, and there's just the normal suffering and going through the motions and all this stuff, and that's all we get, man, we kind of got gypped. And Paul's argument here is because Christ has resurrected, he's also going to resurrect us. Those, who, those of us who are Christians are going to be resurrected. And he makes this case uh, in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 when he talks about the resurrection from the dead and also the coming of Christ. Uh, so look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. This is what Paul says. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Now listen to verse 14. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Now I don't know how many funerals I have preached and used this text, because it goes on to say that, look, God is going to bring us back, and he's going to bring us together so we can be with him forever. But notice what he says. He says, we don't have to grieve as people who have no hope. Now listen, if you're a Christian and you've ever lost someone that you love, as we all have, you, you know you're going to grieve. That's a human thing. Jesus even had grief in his life. It's not sinful to grieve, but don't miss this. If you're a Christian today and you're grieving someone that you love that has died in Christ, we can grieve, but we grieve with hope. Why? The next verse tells us, next verse 14. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, meaning that what he's about to say hinges on Jesus' resurrection. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, or in the same way, 
through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Notice that. In the same way that God brought Jesus back to the dead, through Christ, those who are in Christ will also be resurrected. The hope that we have of heaven, the hope that we have that there is more to life than just the here and the now, the hope that we have that we don't have to grieve like everyone else is because Jesus rose from the dead and he in the same way God is going to bring us who are in Christ back to life. And not only back to life, but he's going to bring us back to an even better life. Look again at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to go to verse 42 down to 44 where Paul is going to talk about what it's going to be like when we're resurrected. Look at verse 42. So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. You see what Paul here says, and and before this he gives the illustration of of putting a seed in the ground. He said the seed's got to die, but when it dies, it comes back as something completely different, something that's got life in it. And Paul here says our bodies are going to be redeemed and restored. What was imperishable will now what was perishable now will be imperishable. If you're in Christ, when you die, You're going to come back to life in the resurrection just like Jesus did. But get this, you're going to come back with a new body, a perfect body, a body that won't age, a body that won't get sick. Coronavirus doesn't matter to this body. Cancer doesn't affect this body. A body that will never again taste death because you've already tasted death. This is a great promise of God we have to look forward to in heaven. And A lot of theologians believe in in heaven our bodies will be uh, at the youngest, healthiest, most ideal stage. And I don't know what that is, but I know that your hip won't hurt and your back won't hurt. I know that you won't have all the problems. You won't need blood pressure medicine. You won't need, you know, you don't need insulin or any of the treatments. Your body's going to be like the Lord's body. In fact, the Bible says when we see him, we'll be like him. But all that hinges on the empty tomb of Easter Sunday. If Jesus, don't miss this, if Jesus didn't come back from the dead, nobody's coming back from the dead. If Jesus, the perfect spotless Lamb of God, the Son of God, one of the members of the Trinity, if God didn't bring him back, he ain't bringing you back, he's not bringing me back, but because God did bring Jesus back, because Jesus did rise again, anybody that's in him now has victory over sin, over death, over the enemy. 1 Corinthians, I don't have time to go over it right now, but 1 Corinthians says that through the resurrection, God has put everything under the feet of Jesus, even the enemy. Death has no more sting, 1 1 Corinthians says. Death has no more sting because of the resurrection of Jesus for those who understand that Jesus died for their sins and have placed their faith in Jesus and that he is now the Lord of their life and the Savior of their life. Death doesn't mean anything. Death is not the end of the story. It's just the change in the chapter. And when we go to heaven for eternity, perfect health and perfect life and perfect strength in the glory of God. That's what Easter gives to you and me. It isn't about bunnies and eggs. It isn't about, you know, even family lunches, as good as those things may be. The reality is Easter changes everything for the Christian because now we have victory over sin and death and every enemy and every obstacle because Jesus has won victory and he's given that to his children. I want to just end by this. What, what does Easter give you as a Christian? It gives you victory. But here's what I think most importantly it gives to us, and it's something that we very much need right now. It gives us hope. It gives us hope. Look at Romans chapter 5, the first five verses. These verses have been very near to my heart through this current crisis that we've been in. I just want to share them with you again, and I want you to see how Easter plays this out. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to just explain that. The word justified means it's a legal term that God has now uh, basically absolved you of your crimes because of Jesus. We've been justified. So now God sees us as if we've never sinned at all. We've got peace with God through our Lord Jesus. Verse 2, go on. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. 
Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And I want to focus in on that last part. You see, again, I said this a couple weeks ago when I preached out of this passage, that suffering is doing something in the life of the believer. It's producing endurance and strength. And though our outer self may be wasting away, our inner man is being strengthened day by day, Paul says. But notice this, the result of the suffering, after you go through this difficult thing, the result, what you're going to get out of it is hope. And notice this, this hope won't put you to shame. I like how one translation says, this hope won't disappoint you. The hope, what's the hope? Because we have a resurrected Savior, we have a living hope. Remember we saw that in 1 Peter. Because we have a resurrected Savior, you have victory over sin and death if you're in Christ today. But here's what I think Easter tells us in the most stark, clearest way possible. The reason that Easter gives us hope today is because it shows us a couple of things. Number one, it shows us that walking with God does not necessarily mean that God is going to insulate us from all suffering. Because he didn't do that with Jesus. Jesus lived a perfectly pleasing life to God. And yet God allowed him to suffer in immense ways. He suffered unjustly. He suffered unfairly. But God allowed him to suffer because there was a bigger thing happening than just his suffering. There was redemption for anyone that would come to him. And so just because you're a Christian, just because you're a godly person, doesn't mean that God's always going to protect you from every bit of suffering. I wish that that were the case, but it's not. And what we have is actually much sweeter. Not God doesn't promise He's going to insulate us from all suffering. What He promises is He's always going to be with us through the suffering, and He's always going to use that suffering to produce something. But here's the other thing that the crucifixion and Easter Sunday show us to give us hope. More than anything... It shows us just because something looks bad, just because something hurts, just because something is terrible, doesn't mean that that's the end of the story. If you were standing at the foot of the cross on Good Friday with the, the women and John the Beloved, if you were Peter watching from a distance Jesus be beaten, you would say, this is a failure, this is a tragedy, this is a nightmare, this is not the way things are supposed to be. And if that's where the story ended, then it's not really worth telling. It's a tragedy. But it's not where the story ended. Just because we're going through a difficult time today, or tomorrow, or the next day, that's not the end of the story. God is going to turn things around. That's what Easter shows us. What was the most colossal failure and amount of suffering in human history, a couple of days later, turns into the most momentous victory in the cosmic and spiritual realm. And now millions and millions and millions of people have placed their faith in Jesus and will not bear the wrath of God and they'll be in heaven forever. That's a tremendous turnaround. And I believe that God, whatever you're suffering right now, I believe that God will give you a tremendous turnaround when you trust in Jesus. It doesn't mean things are always going to go the way you think they should, but God will turn things around and make things good, even out of the worst suffering. I pray today that you have placed your faith in Jesus. And I pray today that you know that the empty tomb means you have a living Savior and that gives you a living hope today. I love you. I'm praying for you. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. And most of all, happy Resurrection Sunday.